Folks, we're back with another Hot Rod Barbecue. Now, this week we've got someone, I always say we got someone special, but this week we got someone special, no less special than anyone else. And she's actually even more special, I think. Um, this week we have got the one and only Tony Breidiger. Now, Tony is an up and coming NASCAR uh, driver and she's great. She is fairly unique. Not only is she a female NASCAR driver, but she's also a Lebanese American. Her mom was uh, Lebanese. Her dad's German, hence the Bridinger last name. And she's great. And we talk all things North Carolina. We talk things uh, California, which is her, which is her uh, birthland. We talk about uh, what barbecue might look like in the future for her as she uh, abandons her vegan status and uh, embraces North Carolina Q. And also we talk about like her history of racing and just her, her ability to cross over between all these different uh, industries, whether it's fashion or makeup or, um, you know, racing in particular, and just what it's like to be 21 years old and living in uh, outside of Charlotte, North Carolina now. So in honor of Tony's interview with us here on the Hot Rod Barbecue, we thought we'd scour the Hemmings classifieds and come up with something that sort of represented Tony and something that, you know, we would love to get behind the wheel of and uh, even dig into just what makes Tony, Tony and celebrate her uh, burgeoning career in NASCAR. So we found an 06 Chevy Monte Carlo NASCAR stock car as it's described and apparently it was an actual real race car and then it was painted up to look like an Earnhardt Jr. car so if you're looking for something you can zip around the, uh, the neighborhood in and hopefully avoid tickets and uh, because there's no turn signals or headlights get yourself one of these like NASCAR retired race cars. There's a lot of them out there. Matter of fact, we've got more of one on Hemmings.com than I was than I was even aware of. So here's one of them, and you can choose between this one and maybe a dozen others just like it. And it kind of makes me think like I want a race car in my driveway, and then I get to pull out at night and maybe like zip around the parking lot and maybe around the neighborhood in. So anyway, dig into that. Take a look and get ready for our very fast and fast-paced interview with Tony Breidinger. We're back on the Hot Rod Barbecue. Now, I've, every time I start off the Hot Rod Barbecue, I say a few things about why we called it the Hot Rod Barbecue as a podcast in the first place, right? And the idea was always to just hang out with people that we like and people we might like, you know, bring over to the house for a barbecue, which is the perfect introduction for today's guest. And that is Tony Bridinger, the next super nascar hall of fame inductee <laughs> what do you think tony does that sound about right that sounds pretty good sounds pretty good does that sound good that's not too much of a i'm not setting you up too hard am i is that just a will that no. work for you Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now for everyone watching this on youtube and you're, if you're hearing this you know on uh, your favorite podcast platform you may have heard, and if you're into cars in any sort of way, you may have heard Tony's name over the past year or so, right? And especially as you like really dug into NASCAR as a career for yourself, right? And I would say like in even so, as you can probably tell, um, Tony is not a 55 year old guy from the South, which is a big deal in NASCAR, I think is, and, it, and by the way, as a lifelong NASCAR freak, uh, and I'm probably not even as much of a freak as some of my friends. It's a big deal. It's a big deal that Tony, you are in NASCAR and that you're making this a career for yourself. I mean, is that is that too much of an overstatement? What do you think? Um, no, I don't think so. I think like you know the big stereotype with NASCAR is that it's an old male, white male dominated sport. So that's kind of right. like what people envision. So I'm not like the cookie cutter NASCAR driver uh, that people typically think of. Uh, but I do feel like times are changing um, and there is like more diverse people getting to sport, more females getting to the sport. Um, so I do feel like it is changing and it's not necessarily that way anymore. Um, but especially for people that don't really keep up with NASCAR, that's kind of like the first image that pops in their head. Right. Because it was always like if, if people who, who just sort of are marginally aware of NASCAR, uh, you know, probably in the 90s, they heard of the whole NASCAR dad phenomenon. And that might have been the last time they heard about NASCAR, really. Right. <laughs> You know? Yeah, 
<laughs> exactly. I feel like NASCAR was popping in like the early 90s, early 2000s and kind of died off and people kind of still think of it in like that way, but it has changed a lot and it's still changing. Um, so hopefully you can kind of grow back to where it was and people can see how much it's changed and how much it's grown. Yeah, like it was such a big deal when NASCAR, all of a sudden, like there were these like, like these NASCAR team jackets that were starting to show up on MTV, like hip hop videos. And we're like, what, how, where did that, come? you know what I mean? Like that, yeah. where did that come from? It seemed like such a clash of cultures, but it was easily adopted. And then that was the, this spike. And then all of a sudden we didn't hear much about it at all. And now in the past, I don't know, 18 months, two years or so, between you and some other drivers like Bubba and some others, you know, that are just entering the sports and also team owners, right? Like suddenly it sounds to me like, uh, you know, NBA stars are talking about owning NASCAR teams, right? Is that, is, is that, are you see that happening? Yeah, I do feel like different people are becoming team owners. We have Pitbull now who owns a team. So Crazy. there's definitely people that are getting interested in it that aren't from the sport and from racing, which I think is cool because it just brings uh, just so much more diversity. And I feel like with more diversity, then more fans will be able to watch and kind of like relate and find a team that they like because it's not like all the teams are the same. Um, so it's exciting. I'm, I hope more like new people are coming into the sport for sure. Like, can you imagine just the conversation that got Pitbull into owning a NASCAR? Like how did that, I would love to have been in that room when like sitting, I'm just picturing like this like lounge in the top of this high rise in Miami and there's Pitbull sitting with his little shades on and his suit and someone brings up, says, do you know what, hey, you know what Pitbull? NASCAR. And what? Like, how does that? Right. <laughs> I don't even have figured that he's like a NASCAR fan or anything. So yeah, like how did that get? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Crazy. right. Yeah, I'm just Mr. W Mr. Worldwide. All of a sudden, NASCAR. Like I doesn't. That, yeah, I'm glad to see it, but that was a, that was wild to to see that. Um, so, and I know you have told this story probably more times than you would like to admit, but especially for like the Hemmings fans. Let me dig into just your background a little bit and how you got into it. And I, like I said, I don't want to put you on autopilot, but like, tell us a little bit, because I know what I do know about you is that you were at least raised, if not born in Northern California. Is that true? Yeah. So I was born and raised in the San Francisco Bay area. So that's where I'm from. Yeah. And then, so then, and I know that also you got into go-karting, I guess, early on, early, right? With you and your twin sister. Yeah. Exactly. Pretty much started go-karting when I was nine. My dad just took me and my sister up to Sonoma Raceway just for fun. Um, my dad has always had like a passion for cars and motorcycles and um, everything like that. So he's always been passionate about it, but he's never really, he never really told me and my sister, oh, I want you to become a race car driver. He was like, oh, let's just go go-karting for fun. Um, be like a fun activity and then me and my sister were like we went go-karts and I bet we caught him by surprise I don't think he thought we were gonna like it at all and um, I was a pretty shy little kid um, but I loved it me and my sister both loved it and um, we just started racing go-karts and it just kind of all started there so you got into like now I've now if, if people don't know um, there's a difference between the go-kart that you can buy from Amazon or that you might go down to like, you know, Home Depot and see and like the right in the lobby there when you walk in, there's a big difference between those and what some people call the shifter carts and things yeah. like that, right? Like what's the difference between what people can just buy, you know, for their, uh, for their driveway and what you do on the track in a go-kart? Yeah, so there's definitely a variety of go-karts. You know, there's the ones that are kind of like lawnmowers that people kind of yeah, right. <laughs> ride around at their house type of deal, which is still fun. It's still great. And it still could be like a way for somebody to get started. Um, but it's intense, like go-karting, like when you are racing at like a national level, there's these big national races and like people have these huge haulers that you would think that like these big race cars are in, but no, it's just go-karts. <laughs> people take it seriously. It's like Go-kart racing was like really intense for what it was. And um, yeah, definitely like the equipment is all fancy and nice and the go-karts go a lot faster than the little lawnmower that you have at your house. Um, so yeah, go-karting is actually like, once you get into like the world of it, it's like intense. People take it really seriously. Like there's some of those carts that, r that are surprisingly fast, right? Like you can get into some of these things that you can, I mean, can you go, can you top hundred miles an hour on a go-kart? 
Oh yeah, like a shifter cart. Like a if you're on cart. a track with like a nice long straightaway, easily you could probably get up to like 110, 100. Um, that's fast for a go-kart. And like, you're so low to the ground that you really think you're going fast, <laughs> even if you're not, um, it's just funny. But yeah, I know you can definitely get up to speed in those. Cause you've got like what, like three inch wheels and you're about an inch and a half off the ground. And like the biggest thing on that cart looks like your helmet, right? Like that looks like the largest thing on a little rig. Oh yeah, definitely. It's pretty much you and just like this little go-kart frame and the engine. And yeah, you're super close to the ground. Like I just remember a few times, even just like coming off the racetrack, like my seat would have a hole in it because of like how much, like how close we were in my seat. Oh my God. Well, we were up, I'm like, Dan, we were a little close there. I was like, I don't know why my seat feels hot all of a sudden. But <laughs> like, why is my butt burning? Right. Off I was track? like a little close, but yeah, no, it's crazy. You're right. Just on the ground. It's wild. And so when, when you were doing, like, how old were you when you were racing those carts? Um, pretty much like nine years old. That's really? Like, That's young. How, like, pretty much as soon as I fell in love with it and just started for fun, like it just kind of like took off and evolved to racing. Wow. And then so you stuck with that all through, obviously all through high school, right? You were still doing it then? Yeah, I didn't get into a race car. I think I tested one when I was 14 and then started racing when I was 15. Um, Cause I was kind of like the general age that people move up into race cars is like 15 years old. Now it's a little different. I feel like little kids are getting in race cars. I'm like, Oh my gosh. But um, yeah, for us, it was like 15 years old when we moved up to race cars. Oh my God. Now I know. So also, I think you came from more specifically, like everyone says the San Francisco Bay area. Right. And people say, Oh, where are you from? And they go San Francisco. I'm like, Oh yeah. What part now for me, I live and I've lived for like 20 years in the city, but you came from Hillsborough, right? Yeah, came from Hillsborough, so more of the suburbs. I was born in the city, but I was never raised there. It's like what I remember pretty much when I was born, my parents bought a house in the suburbs and made that move. Um, so yeah, I grew up in the suburb area, but um, pretty much growing up, my dad had a lot of properties in San Francisco and he was building, oh, wow. um, he did like construction and stuff. Um, so I remember just visiting the city a bunch and just going across the Golden Gate Bridge was like an everyday thing for me. So we'll see in the back then. <laughs> well, you know, and that was like, and that, that question was sort of a tee up to this next one, because I think for a lot of people, when they think about even, I don't, I don't know, what would you call it? Not necessarily the farm leagues, but like, let's say like the pool for future NASCAR drivers, right? Like you don't really think of tier one, heavily urban cosmopolitan areas for, you know, for sort of like a breeding ground for NASCAR drivers, right? You think more like, um, if not rural areas where you have much more access to tracks and things like that, you think of the Southeast traditionally, or now I know that in the Midwest and things like that, and I know that that has definitely been changing in the last 25, 30 years or so, but coming from the San Francisco Bay area, like were your friends really into racing the way you were was that something completely different that you were going off and doing on the weekends and your friends were just going to the mall or to the city or going to concerts I mean was there some sort of disconnect for you there and your friends or was everybody sort of very I don't know mano a mano about that were they all kind of like into racing the same way you were um I think there was a pretty big disconnect yeah um, I think my friends from school there is not like a single person that raced or really like if I asked one of my friends like even in high school when I mentioned NASCAR they were like what's NASCAR they're like NASCAR yeah. I'm like no, no that's <laughs> um but yeah there's definitely a huge disconnect especially I feel like in the Bay Area in California people love cars and like to like show off cars and sports cars but like NASCAR and like stock car racing and like actual racing and not just like cars like people don't know much about it. They know like a nice car and people would like assume like I'm a gearhead and all this stuff. That's pretty much like what conversations would go to in high school. I'm like, I don't know, I don't have my license yet. I just kind of race cars. Um, but yeah, there's definitely a big disconnect. And then like when I moved out here, I was like, it's crazy. I feel like everybody out here is connected to racing somehow. Right, right. Like that, I mean, it's the, it's sort of like just the the bedrock of, of racing is around that North Carolina, Southeast area, right? I mean, that's sort of the heart of it all. Exactly. I would say this is like the hub for NASCAR racing. Pretty much all the teams are out here. Um, so it's kind of like if you want to become a singer, you go to LA. If you want to be a NASCAR driver, you come out to North Carolina. Same type of deal. Right, right, right. Was that a big, I mean, was that a hard move for you or was that just sort of the natural thing? Like, well, if I'm going to keep up with this, I'm going to have to make a move to Charlotte uh, in some sort of way. Yeah, I mean, it was 
hard just because I was like my first time like leaving home and like moving so far away into like such a new place. I knew nobody when I came out here. Um, but there was never a point where I second guessed it. I just knew that that's what I wanted to do. So while I was doing it at the time, I was like full force. I was like, I want to do this. Uh, but then once I kind of got here and I was just sitting in my apartment by myself, I was like, oh, I'm here now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I feel like I was very ambitious. And then when I got here, I was like, oh, this might be a little tougher than I expected it to be just to like make that transition. Well, it sounds like, you know, you like you really have this kind of interesting and, and amazing habit of just stepping, not even stepping, just jumping into brand new things and then just digging into it and figuring it out. Is that sort of, is that sort of accurate? Yeah, I'm definitely the type of person to just like go and do something. I'm like, for me, you can like talk about something all you want, but people aren't going to believe you unless you like you show them and like you go and do it. So I'm all for just like, just going for it. Um, I don't know if that's always good, but <laughs> how I go about life. <laughs> now, let me ask you this too, because this is really interesting to me, especially as, you know, like I said, like I, I grew up, on stock car racing and things like that and dirt tracks and stuff. I mean, the, the area I grew up in, in Pennsylvania, I think we had something like seven dirt tracks within spitting distance. So everybody, everybody I grew up with had like some sort of like t-shirt with like a local sprint car driver on the front of it, right? It was either Steve, and there were literal fist fights between the Stevie Smith fans and the Slam and Sammy Swindell fans. Like that's how like intense it was, right? But where you came from, especially coming from California and the family you grew up in, like it was just part of, it was almost like at a, at a molecular level for people where I came from, but like your mom and dad, did they have, I mean, your mom was Lebanese, correct? Correct. Yes. My yeah. Mom is. So you've got, and your dad with Bridinger as a last name, is your dad German or something like that? Yeah. So his parents moved from Germany. Um, oh, did they really? So his parents were from Germany. Oh, neat. Okay. And like I said, that part of Pennsylvania I'm from, Bridinger sounds like a perfect pe central Pennsylvania name. So that gets uh, right, like a lot of German people out there. <laughs> right. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> but like your home life, I mean, was there, did like your, the, the cultures that you grew up in, did your mom bring like Lebanese culture to the family and to the house and things like that? Did you grow up with like traditions and things? That, that came from, that were stemmed from Lebanon as well as German? Yeah, definitely. I feel like I had definitely more um, just Lebanese, like food and just culture in my life growing up. Um, yeah, my mom definitely, she's huge on that. And um, okay. I feel like I kind of knew more about like Lebanese food and culture than like American culture and food sometimes. Just like remember like going to school and just like having different lunches compared to people. <laughs> and then like when I moved out here, I'm like, wait, where can I get Lebanese food? I'm like, <laughs> or anything um so definitely grew up differently but um it's cool and I just feel like in general the Bay Area um has so much diversity in it too which was cool and I'm kind of grateful that I grew up with just like a lot of diversity for sure yeah that's really true right because like you can there's almost nothing you can't find in San Francisco sort of like New York or maybe a Chicago or even a Miami you know like these major cities have a lot of that influence where people come from all LA right people come from all over the planet to those areas and stuff. And then it almost seems like, and tell me if I'm wrong about this, but it seems like in the last couple of years, like these, I'll call them second tier, but they're not, I shouldn't say it that way to make it sound like they're any less, but like a smaller metropolitan areas, like a Charlotte or a Nashville, or I don't know, you know, like a um, Kansas city. It seems to me like there's more migration from major urban cities to these like smaller urban areas and they're getting more influence from other places and not unlike you right yeah no for sure I mean like when I moved out here a few years ago like Charlotte had so much construction going on and it's grown so much like the uptown area and just like it's crazy like when I'm out there like most people in Charlotte aren't from Charlotte so I feel like there's a lot of diversity there too um and then like and you start moving around like other like the more like rural parts and like everybody's kind of from there but like in Charlotte in the city there's definitely like more diversity I'm excited I'm like okay cool some variety with food and people and it's just like it's exciting to have um some more diversity in it for sure um and speaking of diversity that brings up a great point because it's one of the things I think about too a lot especially with you like I look at you and I see you know I see that you're on 
you know, you're, you show up on like the Ellen show or you're on, you know, you're in paper magazine, you're, you've got like basically as much of a sort of a fashion influence as much as anything else, you know, and popular culture it being what it is and, and being very multifaceted and having all these different um, elements to it. It seems like you in particular have really kind of been a bridge between what used to be like this good old boy sport and very sort of like, you know, insular and, and kind of kept away from, you know, the rest of American popular culture. And then there's everybody else, right? You seem to be like this bridge between the two that we're seeing a little bit more and more of. Do you think that's true? Um, yeah, I feel like I'm just, I don't like feel pressured to fit in with like a certain norm or like stereotype. I'm like, I'm from California. I have a different background. I'm like, I'm not going to go act like all these other people just to fit in. And just so like, they don't look at me weird. I'm like, I'm going to still do my thing and um, still do what I love, even if it's different compared to somebody else. Um, so yeah, I'm never the type of person that wants to fit in a norm. I don't really care if I stand out. Cause I think it's important to just like bring like different aspects. I think racing nowadays like you have to be more than just a good race car driver you have to bring more to the table um I feel like you can't just get sponsors and just you know support if you're just kind of like everyone else and the only offer just being good at racing you need to just offer more and bring more to the table for sure that's what brings up a great a great point too like how did um now I'll be the first to admit I hadn't heard of Young's before you know you before you you know, I'd heard of Hendrick and I heard of all, you know, Penske and all the classic old, you know, the old crowd. Right. But like, how did you get involved with Young's and how did Young's find you and how did that whole relationship start? Because I know you can't really it's not like a hundred years ago when you, you know, in NASCAR you know, and stock car racing, you could just get out there as your own, you know, mechanic driver, you know, team owner and get out there and do like you need to have some sort of sponsor these days, right? So like, how did you find Young's and vice versa? Yeah, um, so basically last year I spent late model racing on just like local tracks in North Carolina. Um, I spent like all last year doing that. And then I felt like we had a good season and I was ready to kind of make the next step up into like the Arca series. Um, so then that's when I was trying to like start searching for teams and I was familiar with some. And um, basically Young's Motorsports was across the street from my late model team shop. So that was kind of oh. like the introduction. They were friends. Um, so that's kind of how we met. And then um, we were kind of just talking to different teams and I just wanted to make sure that whatever team I went with, I really just felt like we vibed well. Cause you can be on the best team and like be on the Penske's of the world. But if you don't get along with your team, you're not going to be successful. Um, so to me, like, yeah, there's all these big, like well-known teams, but I think, you know, it's part of like growing with the team and feeling like you can really um, just grow with them, get along with them and, be successful in the race weekends with them. Yeah, and for people who don't know, so you just mentioned ARCA. Like, how does the, tell me a little bit how that structure works within NASCAR, because you don't just show up and all of a sudden you're a NASCAR driver, you know, yeah. the way you're, you know, uh, but at the same time, you're also not Ricky Bobby, right? Mm -hmm. So like, how, like, how do you actually get into this for someone who wanted to actually get into NASCAR or for someone young who thought someday I want to follow, I want to be the next Tony Bridinger. Like, how do people actually do this? You know, how do you start yeah. in this stuff? Yeah, I would say like the first step is like the grassroots racing at your local short track. Um, for me, like I started in late models and like the stock car and all that kind of stuff. And like, once you get to like the grassroots, then I would say like the next step would be the ARCA series, which is owned by NASCAR. So it's still part of NASCAR's ladder system. Um, and it's kind of cool, like you don't have to follow the ladder system, but there's a pretty clear like ladder system that like just kind of helps pave the way up to the cup series. Um, so basically like the next step for me after the ARCA series would be the truck series, then the Xfinity series, and then the cup series. So it doesn't sound like that many steps, but to make the leap to the next step is definitely a big one. It's a big deal, right? Like it doesn't just happen overnight and you know, there's like the whole paying your dues thing, right? And everything exactly. else. And yeah, 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 yeah. Do you, I kind of picture now maybe, you know, tell me how crazy this is. Like I kind of picture, especially from you coming from North, from Northern California, um, Jeff Gordon, who's also another North, like he, I think he's from Vallejo. Is that true? Yeah. Something yeah. like that. Do you guys ever just kick it, you know, at the Waffle House and just talk about the good old days in, in NorCal? Is that, how, is that how that works? I've never met him. He's like the one driver that I really want to meet, but I haven't met yet. Like, oh, is that right? Oh, wow. wow. I met Jimmy Johnson. He's from California. Is he? I didn't know that. Okay. Oh, cool. 
<laughs> like when you got into this stuff, and I'm sure again, this is forgive me because I'm, I'm sure you've been asked this a million times, but women in motorsports in particular, there have been some, there's a great legacy of women in motorsports, whether it's from drag racing or circle track, right? Um, sometimes boat racing, I've seen some of that in the past as well. Um, do you, I mean, are there people you look up to or other women you look up to and you said, you know, in other sports as well as, as not, not just NASCAR, but like the drag racing scene and Shirley Muldowney or boats and things like that. Does that ever cross your mind or is, are you pretty, or are you pretty like solely focused on NASCAR in particular and circle track? Yeah. Um, when I was a kid and growing up, I honestly, I wasn't like, oh, I want to be a NASCAR driver. I just wanted to be in some form of motorsports. So definitely wow. when I was a kid, I looked up to like everybody in all types of motorsports. Um, and for me, like growing up, I feel like Danica Patrick was like the most well-known female. Um, mm -hmm. So I definitely looked up to her and she was an IndyCar at the time. And yeah, like I feel like I just looked up to like a lot of different women in motorsports just because I wanted um, to do everything when I was a kid. I wanted to do drag racing, Formula One, IndyCar, NASCAR, which isn't realistic. And then kind of when I turned 15 is when I decided to kind of just focus on NASCAR. And that's kind of like the path that I wanted to take. Um, so I feel like now I don't really necessarily look up to people. Like for me, I'm like, I don't want to look up to them. I want to go race against them. So I don't really have like <laughs> idols in NASCAR. I'm like, I want to go race against these guys. I'm not trying to awesome. look up to them. <laughs> You'd rather just beat the pants off of them, right? Exactly. Like, is that kind of... <laughs> I want to pass them. <laughs> <laughs> that's all. spoken like a true racer. I mean, that's sort of like the universal attitude, right? For racing, it's like you just got to be, it, you just got to be faster, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. There's no friends on the racetrack. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's so true. Do you see? I mean, do you even at this stage in your career, do you see a different? type of NASCAR fan now? Cause you know, I think traditionally people would think, oh, you know, NASCAR fans, yeah, going back to that NASCAR dads thing, you know, there's, it's, it's people, you know, who come from the suburbs and they're watching this stuff at home and they grew up with it with their dads and their uncles and it's this male dominated thing. Do you see a difference in fans now or like people who are following you and have interest in you in particular? Yeah, I feel like kind of like the fans that I see showing up to the racetrack are kind of like the fans that you would expect to show up I'm not really like caught off guard like oh like I feel like it's progress like we're making progress and like growing the fan base and I feel like for me I've noticed it mostly on social media not necessarily at the racetracks mm -hmm. um but yeah like I'll get these messages all the time from people saying that they're going to watch NASCAR because of me and they don't typically like NASCAR or racing or they don't know anything about it but they want to start learning because I'm in it now um, so to me, that's really exciting. And I feel like that's really cool to be able to make an impact and kind of get like different people watching the sport. Um, I feel like it just makes it that more exciting. Do you also see like, and I, cause I pay attention to just things like your sponsors, right? Like, so for Huda, which yeah. is like basically a, it's a makeup brand, right? Um, do you see some good crossover? And it seems like you are maybe the crossover actually, because beauty and NASCAR my God, that I don't think those that most people I don't think have ever mentioned those two words in the yeah. same sense, right? Like how like that that seems like a pretty substantial difference and and almost like a mile marker in the in the shift of NASCAR, right? Yeah, no, definitely. I feel like um, I don't really think that many beauty brands have been involved in NASCAR. Anymore. My God, I can't really think of one. Um, like so you might be the first one. Yeah. Right, yeah. Um, so it was definitely really incredible that we were able to get them on board. Um, it was really exciting. I feel like we were bringing like a new sponsor to the sport and they have a large fan base too. And so many people that use their makeup. So I feel like we had new people watching the race and then um, just like, I feel like there was like, I feel like there is a crossover because pretty much like most households have people that use makeup. So I feel like, you know, like makeup is like an everyday product for a lot of people. Uh, so I definitely feel like there's crossover for sure. Um, and it's exciting. I feel like once you kind of start bringing new types of companies into the sport, it'll kind of open the eyes for other people. Um, so hopefully we can start doing that. Yeah, because it almost seems like, I mean, it, it, all, it always seemed to me as though NASCAR in particular was such a great opportunity for things like fashion, like we talked about earlier, like it would, it, it took, it took hip hop to bring like you know, NASCAR fashion into sort of pop culture in their own way, right? And with you and fashion and makeup and I, and, you know, and just looking at the work you've done with just popular culture magazines, like I was saying earlier, like paper magazine and things like that. These 
more um, pop culture brands and and mediums really seem to have picked up on you in particular. And all of a sudden, maybe you're bringing, maybe the idea is that you're bringing NASCAR to the rest of the world instead of the rest of the world coming to, you know, coming to you, right? Yeah, no, for sure. I think it's, um, I feel like, you know, when you start doing things that are outside of the norm and kind of show like, hey, like I'm a NASCAR driver and I'm doing this and like, you're kind of like on these different platforms, just brings so much more attention to NASCAR and just widens that fan base. Um, so I definitely think it's good and um, hopefully we can do more of it because it's exciting to see new fans just liking the sport. That's so cool. Now, just like, you know, the, even though this is a virtual barbecue and someday in the future after like the pandemic is long gone and it'd be great to everyone for, you know, for all of us to get together in person, I got to ask you too, now that you've moved to North Carolina, now you're in the Southeast, right? What's your opinion on barbecue? Because that's a big deal, man. You know, like I will say the first, and, and here's the caveat, having, you know, grown up on the East Coast and sort of like the tip of the Northern tip of the Southeast, I feel like San Francisco in the Bay Area thinks that it's just good at every kind of food imaginable. But one of the things that I've always said is that I don't think the Bay Area can do barbecue very well right? Like we try, we think we're the best at it. And we think we've got these expert barbecuers. I don't think that's true. I mean, what's your, what's your stance? What's your official position on barbecue, especially in North Carolina? Honestly, like, I don't think I've ever had barbecue. You haven't? Like, it's, just, it's not like a thing that comes up. Whereas like here, it's like every single restaurant's barbecue. Yeah. I feel like it's just not really like a thing in California. Um, but I was actually vegan last year. And like when I was 13 is when I became vegetarian. So like this oh. year, like my first year, like actually trying barbecue out here and I'm still like taking baby steps towards it. I don't eat any like red meat yet. Um, but after like my last race this past weekend, we went and got barbecue. I was like, okay, yeah, like I'll try this and like all this stuff. But I kind of just like the potato salad and the mac and cheese. <laughs> <laughs> have, and you had, kind of stuff. have you had grits yet? No, I've never had grits. You haven't tried grits yet? No, oh, that's a big grits. deal. I know. People you might get. You can't get oatmeal out here. It's all grits. I'm like, I like oatmeal. That's a C. Now you're going to have to make that transition at least over to grits or at least get, you know, do them the honor of trying it first, you know? Yeah. You might even have to watch like my cousin Vinny because there's a whole thing about grits in that movie. Like maybe watch that first because it's definitely about New Yorkers traveling to the South and having grits for the first time. That's a big part of the movie. So, you know, just some homework, you know, but okay. Here's another one. Waffle House. I What's your it. position? I love it. Love you love it. a Waffle House. I'm a big okay. Waffle House fan. And I don't know if we, I don't think we have any in California. No, I don't think so. I don't think there are any. Yeah. No, I'm a big, like before races, like Waffle House is my favorite for sure. What do you get at Waffle House? What's your favorite thing so far? Um, I'll get the hash browns and scrambled eggs. And oh, okay. All right. Yeah. So you're making that, you are definitely making that transition from vegan into a Southern eater. Yes, a little bit. <laughs> I don't eat like bacon or sausage yet. I haven't made that much of a leap. Um, but I love their hash browns. Really pretty. The good. hash browns and eggs. Yeah, you can't go wrong with that. You, can. you can't go wrong with that. And with the barbecue thing, at some point, you know, at some point, we'll have to. And by the way, the Hemmings. We've got we've got two headquarters for Hemmings. We've got one in Vermont, which is where Hemmings has been for like fifty years. But then we've also got this management office in Charlotte. And we've got like a lot of connections to the NASCAR scene when it comes to media and things like that too. So when we're in North Carolina, we're going to have to definitely meet up and do some sort of Waffle House thing, I think. Yes, definitely. Do you think so? Okay. Now you're, and where you live now, so you're not necessarily in Charlotte downtown proper, right? Like you're on the outskirts? Yeah, like I could probably get to Charlotte in like five minutes like I'm right kind of like on that border really close to it so I'm not like right in the city I'm more of in like a suburb area okay and I've heard now I haven't been but I've also heard that like the big especially in the summertime the big recreation area out there is it, is it Lake Norman is that what it's called yeah. we're all yeah. the, are you playing yeah now if you're a NASCAR driver I've heard you're going to have to have at least like a pontoon boat or some sort of lake house is that yeah. is that part of the plans yeah, I'm pretty sure every single NASCAR driver has like a lake house or a boat or something. I'm getting there. That's a goal of mine. <laughs> that's a goal. Okay. Because I would almost think like it's got to be like a business expense at some point. Like that's just part of what you have to do. It's sort of state law, I think. You're yeah. going to have to be at, yeah, yeah, lake house, boat, really fast boat, mm -hmm. you know, maybe with like twin small blocks in it or something like that. 
<laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Something with your number down the side of it. I think that's going to have to be in the yeah in the future. All right, we're going to keep definitely keep in touch with you on that because as we watch your progress, the Lake Norman Beach, uh, you know, boathouse and and lake house is definitely going to have to be part of the plan. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Sounds how was how was um, Talladega for you? That was like the, that's one of two. Is that one of two super speedways you've been on now? Yeah, so Daytona was the first one, and yeah. Talladega was my second one, which Daytona was, like, this whole huge experience. Like, I had no idea what to expect. I've never been in a draft or, like, pat in, like, a pack of drafting or anything, like, up until, like, the race at Daytona. So there's just so much going on. I feel like I was just learning so much, and I didn't even have time to process what I was doing. Um, so it was just crazy. And then for Talladega, I feel like I had like a little less nerves because I kind of, you know, I got that first time experience out of the way at Daytona, but I was still nervous because we didn't have any practice. So the first time that I was on that track wow. was like the green flag and I was like, oh my gosh. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, you know, it was crazy. It's like crazy years of banking. No big deal. Just go out there, like no practice. Um, so that was crazy, but the race went well. For sure. now, now I heard you know I watched your I watched your Ellen interview you know and she was asking I know she was asking you about like the fastest you've ever gone and things and I heard you mention that you know on those super speedways in particular like you sort of lose mm -hmm. spatial reference right like every if it's plus if everyone's going that fast you know in some ways it's like if everyone's doing 100 miles an hour on you know uh i5 on in California it doesn't feel like you're doing 100 miles an hour is that is that sort of true yeah, I feel like the track is just so big that it's like, you feel like you're going fast, but it also feels like you're going slow at the same time. It's really weird. Like for me, I feel like I notice the speed, not like at the end of the straightaway, but like through the turns when you kind of just feel like the G-force isn't getting like pressed down into your seat. Like that's when you kind of feel like, oh, okay, I think I'm like going fast right now. <laughs> but no, like when you're like going down the straightaway, just kind of like. Kind just of crazy. Like, it's it's yeah. wide open, right? Yeah. yeah. And you were talking about drafting. Now, for the people at home who don't know or don't follow NASCAR, what is drafting? Tell us, tell us what that is. So it's a lot harder than it looks. I can tell you that. Um, and basically, drafting is when um, at least two cars like get together. And basically, it's to help reduce like the drag. So it's like all about like aerodynamics. If there's two cars, that both of you are going to go faster if you're basically pushing one another or just like really close to each other. Um, it just kind of helps like basically like the air go over you guys instead of like pushing against you. So you go so much faster. It's crazy. Like in um, at Talladega, I made like this little mistake and I just lost the draft, just this tiny amount. And I fell back so fast because everybody was drafting and just like took off. And it's just wild. Like if you're not drafting, you just drop like a rock. It's wild. Wow. And so in the draft, there's like, now, and correct me if I'm wrong here. In yeah. a draft, there's two, a two, there's two cars in it, at least two cars in a draft, right. right? And the one in the behind, there's one in the front and the one behind is so close to the butt of the one in front yeah. of them that is basically being pulled along, right? Exactly. Exactly. You're both kind of going the same pace and the one like behind will usually go like a little bit faster, but if you go try to pull out to pass and you don't have somebody to draft with you, then you're not going to be able to pass because the only reason why you're faster is because you're drafting. So it's like this drafting. whole thing. And like the hard thing for me at Talladega was I have no teammates. A lot of people have teammates or friends out there. I'm like, this is like my rookie year. I have no teammates. So I went to pass these guys. It's like, but if I try to pass them, <laughs> nobody's going to help me out or follow me. So I'm just going <laughs> to fall back. Um, so there's definitely like a strategy that goes on for sure. Oh, wow. So like, and is there like some sort of etiquette? Like if you're pulling up and, and trying to draft in behind, I'm probably using the wrong terminology, but if you're trying to draft somebody, right, you're trying to pull in behind someone, do they, do they kind of have to somehow, I don't know, like somehow let you know that they're going to let you do this or does every, is it just assumed that you can all do this? You know, like if um, you're kind of yeah, I would say it's assumed that you can all do because you're helping them. Like if you're drafting with somebody, it's going to help them too. So for me, if I'm by myself, I'm hoping that somebody goes and drafts with me so we can kind of work with each other and like get up there. Um, so it's kind of like assumes that like, you know, you're drafting to help each other out until like it comes down to like the end of the race and like nobody's helping each other out. It's like <laughs> out there for themselves. Um, but yeah, definitely like during the race, you want to find like a little buddy to work with. So it's not like pro wrestling where everyone gets ahead, gets together ahead of time and go, okay, now you're going to do a super fly off the top thing and I'm going to do a flip. And then you, you punch me in the face. Like, it's nothing like that, right? You guys are out there literally just 
at some point, and I understand, I understand the teammate dynamic, but at some point, everybody's in it to win it, right? Yeah, exactly. Like there's teammates and like, you can like make a plan with your teammates that you'll do this. And like, you'll kind of help each other out when like the drafting and all that kind of stuff. And let's say your teammate pulls out to make a pass and you're going to follow them. That's kind of like the general like rule of thumb. Um, but like when it comes down to last lap, you don't have any teammates. So <laughs> <laughs> Now, like, have you been practicing? Cause I now, uh, I think, was it Talladega? You round out the top 12. Is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's great. Congratulations, by the way. That's amazing. That's awesome. And tell me a little bit about in, in going back to like the the ladder you were talking about. Um, there's there's NASCAR and then within NASCAR under the umbrella, there's like the Craftsman trucks, right? There's ARCA. Um, did ARCA replace what used to be called the Bush Grand Nationals cars? Is that uh right? I so there's the Xfinity series, which Xfinity I think- Xfinity series, be, right. But that is, yeah, so Arca is kind of, um, I would say Arca is more similar to those cars and they are the trucks. Obviously the trucks are like this whole right. different animal, uh, but yeah, it's all part of like the ladder system to get to the cup series. And what's the difference between, like when it comes to the actual cars themselves, <laughs> like what's the difference between like your Arca car and, you know, uh, I don't know, like, and, and Bubba Wallace's car? Like, what's the difference in cars? Um, I feel like there's kind of like they kind of look the same from afar. Like, if you don't really know, right. like, like aerodynamically, like they're completely different race cars. Like, the spoilers are different. Just like aerodynamic wise, totally different. Um, they have a lot more technology in them. Our cars are kind of like old version of like the cup cars. Um, and then also like the engines are different. The cup cars have a little more horsepower, different type of engine. Um, so there's definitely a lot of differences, even though they look similar, there's a lot more than you would think. Uh, okay. So like with your, with your ARCA cars, do there have, are there, and I know it used to be like this and, um, and people talk about this a lot, like the, you know, the actual, um, the belt line has to be sort of factory or the roof line and trunk, you know, have to be in some sort of factory shape, but then things kind of can get a little muddy after that. Is that sort of the way the ARCA cars are designed too? And are they, and are they like steel, aluminum, or what are they made out of these days? Yeah, so basically like with the ARCA series to like keep the cost low, like there's a lot of like rules set that you have to follow. And for like all the cars, like we all have the same engine, even though it says like Ford or Chevy or Toyota, we all have the same engine under the hood just to keep it like cost effective for everybody. They're all Elmore engines. Um, so I feel like it also like evens out the playing field, like pretty much like when you see like a manufacturer in the Arca series, it's kind of like just stickers on a race car a little <laughs> bit, like we're all kind of like the same race car. Obviously, like the teams will do like different stuff with like the aerodynamics and all that kind of stuff. Um, but they do keep like the field pretty equal in the Arca series. Once you get to the Cup series, it's a little more different. Um, but I do feel like they try to keep like the cost low for us in the Arca series series, just because, you know, it's still kind of like the bottom tier a little bit of the NASCAR series. So you don't want it to be too crazy expensive for anybody because we're kind of working our way up. So like if people, if someone, you know, we were talking earlier about like someone young who wanted to get into this, um, does, is ARCA where they might start, you know, when they, when they want to get to like this, to this tier of racing? Yeah, I feel like ARCA would be like, once you feel like you get enough experience in like stock cars and you want to like make the step up, because it is like a big step. I, I did my first ARCA race back in 2018. And then once I did it, I was like, okay, I have a feel for it, but I don't feel like I'm going to be able to compete for like top fives where I'm at. I feel like I just don't have enough stock car racing under my belt. So that's why I went back and I did late model racing for a couple of years, just because I feel like I really wanted to perfect the race craft and just understand the stock cars. Because when you're in the Arca series, it is like a higher level. So you shouldn't like it's you're learning, but you don't want to also be making like a bunch of mistakes in that series because it is more expensive. It's on TV. You're going at faster speeds. Um, and there's more people in it that are like taking it seriously, not just doing it for fun. Um, so it's kind of like, it's a learning series, but you also want to learn at like lower levels as well. That makes sense. And when you were starting, and I know this, now this is probably getting a little nerdy for us, uh, yeah. for some people, but like, I know that in some cases where I, like where I grew up, it was all dirt. Right. And I, and we had always heard growing up on the East coast, we had always heard that somewhere around, I don't know, the middle of the country, the Mississippi River and sort of west of the Mississippi, then things became asphalt, even at the local track level, right? And it wasn't dirt track racing, it was at, they were racing on asphalt and stuff. Now, I came out to California, 
and I hit places like Watsonville or Petaluma, and those were dirt tracks. Yeah. Like, did you grow up on dirt then? You know, and I, and I know like the, the carts are different. Carts are all asphalt, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. But like, did you grow up on, on dirt and then switch over to asphalt or was it always asphalt? So basically after I did kart racing, like all over the country, um, I got into midget racing, which a lot of people think midget racing, they think dirt, but I did a lot of it on pavement for the most part. I think I, I only did like a couple dirt races. Um, and like at first, like when I first started getting into midgets, I tested it on dirt my first couple times. Um, so I did like get a little bit of dirt experience and that's kind of where like midgets are popular. If you say midget, people think you're going to talk about dirt racing. Um, yeah. but for the most part when I was out in California and on the West coast racing, those it was all pavement. Okay. And so when you did get on dirt, was it completely different? Was it having to like relearn racing all over again? Or what was the differences there? Yeah, I know it's totally different. Like, I feel like you almost have to unteach yourself, like what you've been learning all these years. Cause like in go-karts and on asphalt, like if the back end comes out, you're going to counter steer it. But in dirt racing, like you're not supposed to, you want to let it slide. And I just remember like, it took me all day to just like not counter steer. I was like, I can't like, it's just like my initial reaction to just catch it when it starts stepping out. And it's just like such like, you just have to like unlearn everything. And it's totally, <laughs> it's totally different. So it's, so it's a little bit like uh, that, like the movie Cars, right? Where he had to kind of unlearn and kind of <laughs> on dirt. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, did you watch that for tips? And you're just kind of like, okay, and then you watch that scene again a couple of times oh, yeah. and get the dirt track. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so what's next? I mean, for you in particular, like, you know, and obviously we understand what the natural progression is, um, but you've made, you made the big leap to, to North Carolina. You jumped in there with both feet, right? Um, you've got, you've got your, your car, you've got your ARCA team set up and everything. What's next? Like, what do you want to do next in, in this scene? Um, I would say, you know, like the next like things for me are like ARCA races and just learning the big tracks. Um, I'm so used to like these little short tracks and like last weekend, I got some experience on a mile and a half track and there's just so much to learn, like going onto these bigger tracks and just like aerodynamics and all this stuff like comes into play, which is like this whole new thing that I'm learning. Um, so for me, just like some more ARCA races are coming up, which is exciting. I can like learn a little bit more on these bigger tracks and like my next like big leap would be like my truck debut. Nice. Oh, that would be fun. Yeah. We're going to make sure we're going to make sure that we're gathered around the TV yeah. for that one. Yeah. Right. We'll have to throw another hot rod barbecue just to watch you doing that. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that would definitely be a fun one for sure. Do you see that? I mean, one of the things that again, growing, growing up with NASCAR, um, you know, it, you know, the fun and especially for kids, especially like as I was a kid, the fun was like obviously watching crashes, you know, or watching like the the personalities of the sport really being the things that you could follow. You know, like you didn't just follow a car, you followed Awesomeville from Dawsonville, or you followed the intimidator and you wore his t-shirt and you sort of became like that was that was the flag that you wore on your back, right? And like we were talking about before we got on online here, you know, like we used to fight, you know, getting fist fights over that, like who's wearing whose t-shirt. And that was a big argument, not unlike football, you know, or hockey, you know, teams and things like that. Like, do you see, like when it comes to personality, as far as personalities driving NASCAR as a sport, in the last couple of years, at least to me, it always seemed like, NASCAR was kind of pumping out these, I don't know, these cookie cutter drivers where they all sort of look the same. They kind of all talk the same. Um, no one seemed to really, you know, uh, throw down or, you know, uh, you, you know, challenge anyone to a duel on TV, you know, things like that. I mean, you, then you come along and it seems like you are just, you know, this, this huge personality that somehow now, I think in a lot of ways, is introducing people to the sport in ways that there's probably a whole bunch of girls out there who never in a million years would have known what the word ARCA ever meant, right? And here you come. Do you see that as, you know, as, as something that you can kind of really use as a, almost as, as, a, as a driving force, pardon the pun, um, in the sport in the future? Because you do seem like this personality that transcends NASCAR. You can, you can live in the fashion world and you can live in sort of the makeup industry or you can live on television as 
you know, as a daytime guest and you, you can carry that really, really well. I don't think a lot of NASCAR drivers can do that. I mean, does that, is that a strength that you see as something that works for you? Yeah, definitely. I think it's important, like I said before, just like bring something else to the table. And I do feel like a lot of these drivers are kind of like cookie cutter, like copy and paste, all kind of the same. I feel like that's yeah. kind of like when the sport lost like some fans, because like when you root for somebody, it's because you like them as a person. Like, yeah, you might like how they race on the racetrack or whatever, but like you really have to like the person to like follow them and just turn on the TV to root for them every weekend. It's not just to watch cars turn left, like you need something else there. Um, so I feel like it's important to be like a personality and um, to be somebody that somebody would like to follow and like an influencer in a way. Um, I feel like that's definitely important. It's not just about driving a race car, which unfortunately some guys think like that. They don't really care to do social media or interact with fans. They just want to drive a race car. And I get it. That is our job. At, but at the end of the day, we're so much more than just driving a race car around the track. Well, you bring up a really good point. Like it's, you know, the media industry and media in general I mean, you can't escape it. And, and now we're, you know, some 20, 20, well, 20, 25 years into just, you know, digital media and then social media being the juggernaut that it is. It's like, yeah, you can't just be a driver alone anymore, right? I mean, that's just, or, or if you want to do that, don't expect to make a career out of it. Is that sort of true? It sounds kind of harsh, yeah. but it's kind of true, it seems like. No, yeah, I mean, like, times are changing, and, like, you could try to ignore it and, like, pretend that it's not, but it's happening, like, social media is huge, and I feel like one of, like, the insults that people try to give me is, like, oh, you care too much about social media, or, oh, you should care more about racing than do social media, it's, like, bro, like, how do you think I'm racing right now, it's because I'm promoting my sponsors and, like, growing my social media following, because that's huge, like, it's not just about slapping a sticker on a race car, I'm, like, if I want to go racing, then, like, I need to interact with fans, and, also, like, I enjoy it. It's just like, it doesn't take away from racing. When I'm on the racetrack, I'm driving, I don't have my phone out. So <laughs> it's not like, <laughs> right. or anything. <laughs> that would be actually pretty cool though. If we can figure out how to, like, as you're driving in a race, yeah. if you can be like, what's up, Every, you know, and just kind of. Like <laughs> I have like a few like in-car cameras and my um, crew chief came on the radio. He's like, wave to the cameras. I was like, hey guys. <laughs> <laughs> So you could be like Ricky Bobby and just drink your, you know, drink, read a book or drink your like pepper, you know, your, your tea as you're driving around the track. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Do you see like, as, as the sport, especially as NASCAR and, and racing in general embraces social media as it is, as, as it should be. Right. Um, do you think that in some ways more like younger drivers or younger possible drivers and younger people are going to get into this because they're just seeing more of it in across, across social media, not just on, you know, Fox sports on Sunday afternoon or NBC or wherever actually carries the NASCAR thing. Is that sort of true? Yeah, no, I definitely feel like social media is where like you're going to get these younger fans. And I think it's important to get them because they're the next generation. They're going to be the ones that are sitting in the grandstands like 30 years from now, you know? So I feel like it's important to get those, younger fans and it just like widens the audience also um so I definitely think social media is really important and for me like that's what really grew my fan base to like have like a younger fan base because before it's kind of like your typical like NASCAR driver fan base but now like like half of my followers are in the middle east and like I have so many more female followers and it's exciting to see like just like the demographics are so much wider than what they were before just because of social media Dude, I was just going to ask you about that. So you're Middle Eastern fans, right? Like I am, I am just, just fascinated by this. How, like, how do they, how are they embracing you? And what do they think of you? Like, how, and obviously you have fans. I mean, they love you, but, but what, are, are there any kind of like weird crashes of, or clashes of culture that you didn't expect or that you've seen that are sort of interesting? Cause I can't imagine what it must be like to, you know, be, a Lebanese American, much less a Lebanese, you know, um, um, you know, citizen and watch you do what you do. Are people looking at you like you're driving some sort of spaceship or something like that? Like, do they, do, do they understand what the, what NASCAR is? Yeah. Um, it's crazy. Cause I like never really expected to get like a following in the middle East. Cause like all my races are out here. I'm like, I don't really have yeah. like direct like ways to like reach people out there. But then with um, it was just like TikTok that kind of like kickstarted that. I feel like I just reached like that fan base all of a sudden and it just kind of grew and they all just supported me so much. And they thought it was like the coolest thing. I started getting all these messages of how inspirational I am and all that kind of stuff. Um, 
from all these people out there and it was really amazing. So I feel like they've all just been so supportive. Um, so yeah, it's been really exciting. They definitely they have my back and it's exciting. I'm like, I want to do race out there now. I've never raced in the Middle East. So that'd be really cool. I was going to say, is there such a thing? I mean, well, could, could NASCAR ever host races in some sort of like, you know, consistent way in the Middle East or in other countries? I mean, I know they do some already, but. Yeah, like, I know like NASCAR tried to do, like we do have like a race in like Canada, I think. Which yeah. Was. Um, and I know like they've tried to do, I want to say like in China, like a race before, like way back when, um, it just makes it more expensive if you're going to like race internationally, like frequently. Um, but like, that'd be cool. Like I could see it like in the future, maybe NASCAR kind of going in that direction of having some more international racing. Um, but that'd be cool to do a race, like even outside of NASCAR and like a sports car, just like something cool, um, out there would be really amazing. Even if it's not just with NASCAR. Yeah. Cause like Europe, Europe, and I guess that, that part of the world, it mm -hmm. seems like, you know, F1 is popular and all, probably exactly. always has been, or like desert racing and things like that. But yeah. yeah, but NASCAR seems just such like a, just such a, an American experience, right? Like it's just like an American is it's as American a sport yeah. as say baseball, right? Exactly. Exactly. I think that's kind of like what ca caught people's eye too, because they're like, oh, like, because for them, like they don't follow NASCAR. So they would think it's kind of like very like American, white, old male dominated. And then like, yeah. I'm girl, that kind of just like popped up on their TikTok page doing this. So I think that's kind of what caught people's eyes at first. It's like, oh, like NASCAR is like this. Um, so I think that kind of just opened up people's eyes to NASCAR. Does your mom ha still have family back in, in Lebanon? Yeah. We still have a lot of family out there. Yeah. Oh, good. Do you visit very often? Do you mean do you get to see, do you get to go over there? I haven't gotten to visit yet. I've been wanting to, but like as soon as like this COVID thing chills out, I think yeah. that's really the first place that I go to. Um, Cause I've been wanting to visit there for so long. I know my mom's been wanting to go back. It's just, it's not always like a good time to go there. And you know, like with racing, it's been hard to travel. Like I never really travel unless it's for racing. Um, so I definitely hope I can make it out there soon. That would be so amazing to actually see you in, oh my God, you in your ARCA car zipping around, you know, uh, Lebanon would be absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with your TikTok account, that would be so okay. cool. <laughs> Okay, we're gonna have to make that happen. I think yeah. we're gonna have to figure out how to make that happen. Yeah. <laughs> well, Tony, this has been amazing. I I cannot wait to see what you do next. I think we all feel the same way about this. And for like for us, we look at you and we're just like, this is the if this is the new face of NASCAR, we are all back in again. You know, because I think a lot of us, in some ways, we kind of I don't want to say we got bored with it, but we just kind of lost our way with NASCAR, even though we grew up with it we just we just walked away from it because it just didn't have for us what we wanted anymore or at least it didn't have the fascination we had as kids but like here you are and i think you are bringing some some interest back to this sport that really does cross a lot of cultural lines right definitely yeah and no, i feel like you know like the world's changing every day everybody's changing every day and growing and i feel like this sport just kind of stayed like where it was at and like didn't grow and like keep up with everything else um so we can kind of like get it to grow and just keep doing that. And I feel like the fan base will grow back again. And it'll just overall be a more exciting sport. Okay. Now two more things I have to ask you. Number one, goodies, headache powder. Where do we stand on this? Have you tried I've, it yet? Never had it. You've never, never had it. No. Okay. So we're gonna have to follow up with you on that. You're going to, have to try yeah. goodies, headache powder and just see what you think. Don't be afraid of it. It's a little strange when you first see it, but I don't know, you know, that's a weird one too. Okay. And then, uh, two, um, what is, have you had rc cola yet no i haven't you haven't had rc okay so that's coming as well all right no i haven't okay had. we're going to follow maybe what we'll have to do is maybe we'll have, we'll come back down to charlotte and we'll do a hot rod barbecue down there yes. find out when you're available find out when you're in town at once the covid thing is we're, we're all past this maybe next year at some point and then we'll yes. figure all this out together well maybe we'll come up with those answers together perfect yes yeah, way too much RC cola, maybe some way too much barbecue, and then goodies headache powder. It seems like those are the th things in line that we have to do. Yes. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, Tony, thanks again. Really appreciate you coming on board. We will definitely keep in touch with you. And next time, hot rod barbecue in person. Perfect. Sounds awesome. Great. Thanks for having me. Talk to you soon. See ya. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for listening, folks. And again, please subscribe to the Hot Rod Barbecue podcast. If you're on Spotify, check us out there. Subscribe to it on iTunes. And if you are going to go to YouTube, make sure you go to the Hot Rod Barbecue podcast. 
and uh, hit that subscribe button, and we'll come to you every week.